We're back again with another Q and A questions in alcohol, and this time around, we're focusing more on the alcohol and a little bit of fun as well. We're joined by Nathaniel Gravely, of uh, President and Founder of Gravely Brewing in Louisville. Nathaniel, thanks for uh, hopping on. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I, I appreciate the time, and uh, I, I want to say before we start, I, I, I appreciate the beer as well. I've I've been able to enjoy it for for a little while now, and, and it's always a good pour when I get. One. And that's always good to hear. So I'm glad you're enjoying the product. That is why we're in the game, after all. <laughs> now, now I'm curious as to how you got there because when I, you know, I was looking up some questions to ask you, I, I noticed you were an anthropology major along with a few other things. Uh, how did you end up in beer, though? That did, that seems like a little bit of a uh, not, sure. not exactly the the normal path to to, to beer. How does anyone end up in beer? I guess that's a question <laughs> for really the entire industry in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, no, I was an anthropology and history major at the University of Kentucky and, um, you know, was thinking about just majoring in things that I enjoyed at the time um, and potentially figuring out the rest of it later, whether it was a graduate program or law school or whatever else. And my first passion has always been music, actually. So um, I started a music website around the time of kind of starting college. That was a, a music blog before blogs were a thing. Uh, kind of right time, right place, good combination of having a good ear and some writing ability led to the website to becoming influential in that sphere of music, independent music. Um, and that led me to a job up in New York City at MTV. Uh, I worked there for five years. And, you know, I was saying music's my first passion and beer was probably my second passion. Um, so you know, those two things, my concept sort of grew out of one, wanting to have a music venue first and foremost to kind of scratch that ish and that passion. Um, and then over time, business model wise and just secondary passion wise, it became kind of evident that, you know, fusing music and beer together in a way that was a little more thoughtful than uh, just doing the old 12 ounce arm curl at a, at a rock and roll show um, <laughs> made sense. So I kind of wanted to take a brand and sort of as the marketing guy who always loves marketing and design this is another passion of mine, I guess I was fusing something together where music sort of inspired the beer, uh, beer in turn wouldn't help inspire the music and kind of put a live music and fresh beer component together because I think both of those experiences are super unique to their own situation. And, um, you know, the music industry having worked in it and been a part of it for such a long time has changed radically over the last 10, 20 years um, as it continues to evolve. But I do think one thing that's irreplaceable placeable is the live music kind of concert experience pandemic be damned obviously um but that being said like you can't recreate a live show you can live stream it a million times you can record it but it's never the same thing as actually being there and experiencing it and i feel very similarly on the flip side for for beer it's great buying it off a shelf it's great going to tap rooms uh, and bars and restaurants around your neighborhood and town but it's always the best at the brewery um and i don't think you can replace fresh beer uh, with anything packaged or anything of that nature which I think is important and obviously a big part of the game, but at the same time, it's just like live music. You want to go to the place, see the band, you want to go to the brewery, drink the beer. So kind of creating those two things made a lot of sense to me. Well, and, and I was going to say too, I mean, it, 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 you know, you get call yourself craft beer, craft music, but when did you decide to launch, you know, a brewery? I mean, cause obviously at the end of the day that there's capital involved and investors to, to find i mean what what drew you to go okay this is what we need to do and 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 what ended up turning into to gravelly brewing um it was just a natural gestational period i would say like the idea had to get incubated for a long time any entrepreneur doesn't just arrive on the scene and snap their fingers and create a business usually that idea and passion is cultivated internally externally for quite a while and starting with the live music venue concept, I was fortunate enough to do some events with Flying Dog Brewery uh, based out of Maryland at the time, uh, Colorado. And it just so happens that their founder was actually best friends with Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson obviously is from Louisville and I had kind of not from Louisville area, but earmarked Louisville as a, a city that has a lot of potential for small business and also a, a growing, but maybe not completely solidified craft beer scene. So there's a good business opportunity there and started talking to those guys about starting a nano brewery that they would help run. And then I would run the event side and, and the music side, et cetera. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, getting into the business model side of things, you know, once you kind of see and understand where a live music menu makes their money, which is mostly bar sales, uh, you start to sort of realize that, well, I should just make the beer and cut out the middleman. Um, <laughs> I, I am, uh, 
a a blossoming home brewer at times, but never someone who would trust myself with a commercial brewing setup. So at that they're point, not letting you back make, in the the in that area very much, are they? <laughs> I mean, I I dabble. I go back there and um, I know enough to get around. If I like, you know, pardon my French, if shit hit the fan, I could probably fumble around <laughs> the uh, the brewery. But like, no, never to the scale of what we are or what we could become. So uh, after making the decision to kind of like we need to make our own beer. I first started looking for a brewer uh, in the whole process. So that was the kind of the first step. And then after getting that part figured out, then it became about uh, how much does it cost, capital, et cetera. Well, and then you've, you've touched on this already that your love of music and, and beer kind of, cro- you know, kind of crosses it with this brewery. Why is music such a, a big part of that? Is that just because it's kind of your first love and then beers your, or maybe it's one A, one B? Maybe, I mean, maybe, I guess the short story maybe I should say that would be yes. And, maybe I should say 2A and 2B uh, behind your wife, right? <laughs> yeah, wife and kids. So maybe three. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the short answer is yes, because, you know, like like majoring in anthropology and history in college, I just wanted to do stuff that I was passionate about um, and that I enjoyed, right? And I think that's kind of the recipe for not just success, but having like a fulfilling life to some degree. Um, and fortunately, you know, obviously those paths aren't easy. Like it's hard work still, no matter how you slice it up. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just, I thought there was an experience sort of missing, uh, in the beer and and music marriage side. Like obviously the two things are tied together in a lot of ways, whether it's big brewery sponsoring things or mess festivals and things of that nature, but I'd never had really seen a brewery kind of model itself after, a song lyric or an artist or anything that was like just tied in from, you know, our wall of sound display at the bar to like the branding of the G note on our logo. It's all baked into kind of what we do. Um, And I know there are, there are tons of breweries that have live music. Like it's not something super unique to us, but I think down to our core, it does differentiate us a little bit from the experience that the customer has. And I come in here, whether it's for a show or just have a beer. Well, and you talked to, and you just kind of mentioned it, you know, even the, the, the names of the beers are either a song name or inspired by a song. So how, how does that work? Do you have taste the beer and go, okay, this is what this is, or do you kind of have an idea or is it just, just whatever kind of happens back, back in the, the creative lab? Oh man, there's been a lot of back and forth on this over the last four or five years, but <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, it's preference, I think, to some degree, like music that either the brew staff listens to or I do, or, you know, if there's a certain influence at a certain time, whether it's a beer that means more to someone and a song that matches it. Um, you know, originally, for example, like our hazy IPAs, which is a style that originated from the Northeast, we kind of fixated on naming most of our hazies after the Pixies because they are from Massachusetts originally. Um, so that's, we've deviated a little bit from that here from time to time, but you know, there's not like a certain hard and fast rule. I think naming beers in general, whether it's music inspired or not, is definitely its own unique art form. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to have something that like rolls off the tongue and looks good on a menu, can fit on packaging potentially nicely. So naming things, you know, there's a there's a funny, there's a band that's literally called And You Will Know Us by the Trail of the Dead. Like I can't name a beer after that because that is way too long of a name. So, you know, there's like a phonetic art, I think to some degree, and music is a good guardrail for us to stay within. But um it's not it, it's like you have some songs that are like five words long and you're just like well three words is the sweet spot two is ideal <laughs> so it's like you're trying to keep it short not just for many purposes but because when people want to order something they call it by the name obviously so you got to have something that's easy enough for them to digest and potentially for our sake as a business reorder <laughs> <laughs> very 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 true i i'll say this i always enjoy the the bomba when i'm when I'm over there or when I catch it in, in stores. And I, 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 like I said, I just love how you tie the music into it and whether that's on the website by uh, showcasing the songs that, that go, go with the brew or, or, or so forth. You, you mentioned it too, the, the wall of, of um, music. I, I don't what, what do you call that wall behind the bar? Uh, we call it the wall of sound. The wall of sound. So how long and how many things are part of the wall of sound? I mean, I, I could go look at a very old spreadsheet and tell you exactly how many things, but, um, a couple more is, than a couple. <laughs> yeah. It's the length of our bar, which I think is probably about 50 or 60 feet long total. So it's a, uh, it's a big bar. It's a big bar display. And a lot of that stuff was either hand me down from our parents or stuff that we had lying around when we upgraded or a ton of it is thrifted and pulled from flea markets and things of that nature. 
Uh, and then the cabinetry was built to house all the specific things that we had found kind of along the way as we were building out the brewery itself. Um, so it's a, the custom cabinetry that makes it sing and look as good as it does. Um, a lot of the, for the longer period of time until recently, actually, we were playing music through the wall of sound. Um, and it just over time kind of became one of these things that was hard to maintain a little bit. And, you know, just like technology going out from time to time, when you have stuff that's built in the seventies, it's great. And they don't make it like that anymore, but there is a certain crackle and a certain uh, degree of failure that comes along with it. So I think after a while we kind of upgraded and now it's just nice. It's nice art displayed back there. I, I was going to say, I mean, to me, that's like a perfect conversation starter. Cause I mean, you have just a little bit of everything uh, on, on that wall of sound and, and is it just fun to look at it from time to time and, and look back at music history, especially being someone that loves history and music. Sure. I mean, I've, I've never gotten sick of looking at it. And if I had a, a dollar for every time somebody came in and pointed to something they owned or had this like immediate wave of nostalgia turning the corner to come look at the tap room, I mean, I could probably fund like three other breweries at this point because <laughs> it's worked to that degree. And I think evoking that feeling from a visual standpoint uh, and being tied to memory of, of their own is a huge part of the customer experience. Um, so I, I think it works very nicely for a, a myriad of reasons. Well, and then, like I said, I, I've enjoyed your beers that I, I've gotten to have, especially I got over there before the, the pandemic and got to just enjoy the the brewery or maybe it was mid pandemic. I can't remember now. It feels like this has gone on on for a good little while. But uh, what what can folks expect that maybe have not been able to visit your brewery when they go there and what beers can they expect? Uh, well, we keep 14 taps on almost at all times. There's some variation in there, but mostly it's 14 of our own beers. You know, you can expect some of our, our tried and true sort of core styles to be up there, which, you know, you've had La Bamba, which is our Mexican lager, which is on there frequently. We have a Hefeweizen called Doc's Hefe, which is super, super popular. And, and uh, another core, Power Core, our West Coast IPA, DeBaser, our, our Northeast Hazy IPA, um, are always kind of rotating around. Um, and then we mix it up with other styles. Like right now we have a, a traditional German Rausch beer on, which is a smoked lager. Um, there's also like a bohemian pilsner on or bohemian lager on right now which is a dark traditional bohemian czech style lager um, so we you know we kind of experiment with some things i'm actually about to after this uh interview call and uh, do a post for a hurricane beer which is going to be mm. a fruited ale uh that is modeled in style of the hurricanes for uh, mardi gras coming uh -huh. up so it's a nice it's got a nice red hue to it and has I think passion fruit and grapefruit and some other flavorings in it. So it's a limited release. You know, we do fun stuff like that around holiday times or some kind of events. So that's some of the beer stuff you can expect. And then obviously we try to pride ourselves on having a really good customer experience from the service standpoint. And then being just like a big kind of sprawling space. Like we're, we have a big music venue that we clear tables out of for big ticketed shows, but most of the time we're doing free kind of weekend music. And obviously that's been kind of muted over the past couple of years, but we are, I think, excitedly looking forward to getting back to that here in the next couple of weeks uh, and hopefully doing that more on an ongoing basis heading into spring, summer and, and fall as this pandemic hopefully shifts it to the rear view, hopefully, <laughs> uh, finally at the, end, at the end of all this. So, I mean, it's all about the atmosphere, I think, coming here. And, you know, one thing that I think changed my opinion of our own space, like in the first couple of years we were open was I wanted to do obviously more music and have ticketed shows and become more of a venue. And, you know, I, I forgot or overlooked the fact that breweries are such a community space um, that serve a lot of functions, not just for meeting up with friends and family and neighbors and all that stuff, but like hosting events and doing things in the stage environment that are not necessarily music, which I think is a huge asset for a space like us, but also a huge part of, of breweries and something that I think has been sorely missed the last two years during the pandemic because none of that stuff's been able to happen. So we've kind of shifted focus to, to provide more of the ambiance and atmosphere with local roots or bluegrass music or even cover bands and things of that nature to kind of just make the, the vibe what we want it and then kind of supplement that with all of the community gatherings and meetups that we have here on a frequent basis. I was going to say breweries are, are at the heart and soul connected to the community and, and they're a, a, an amazing part to just, you know, give back and, and to, to lift up um, different causes. Um, you know, you, you talk about just the, the atmosphere, the inside of it is awesome. I enjoy the outside. I got to ask, what in the world is that giant door on the outside there that goes into the, 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 the grounds off to the side? 
yeah or those, aren't, go? those aren't just you... doors those are yeah so we're we're actually on somewhat hollow ground here in the sense that uh, there was actually a brewery here in the late 1800s um called phoenix brewery uh and it was a huge complex like the building next door to us is actually um the last kind of freestanding structure of that original like three four block big complex um and those tunnels caverns that are in the hillside and our patio are actually the old loggering tunnels for the brewery so uh -huh. As the history major, as you pointed out a couple of times, I <laughs> ate that. I ate that up when I toured the facility before we we moved in here. And I mean, it's really really cool. People would love to go down in them, but you know, they're they're not unsafe by any means. They're definitely structurally sound. It's just more of like how do you get fresh air in there, and it's leaky because groundwater comes through. So I would love to figure out a way to make it a thing. But right now, they're just like a cool part of history to kind of look at and realize that man, they were literally lagering you know, ales and, and barrels of stuff in there forever ago, like 200 years ago. <laughs> and here they are just <laughs> still, still existing. That, that is awesome. And who knows, maybe that, that might be a different project. You can bring back some lagering down, the, down there as, as well. <laughs> yeah. Don't know if the TTB would love that, but <laughs> we can, uh, we can certainly try at some point. Uh, well, I mean, it's all about having fun. And, and I also find, find it fun too, that, you know, you work as kind of a husband and wife duo. Um, you and your wife currently are running it, and you even kind of launched it all with, uh, I believe, your brother-in-law and his wife. So what, what's that like, working with family, and do you always get along? <laughs> uh -huh. um, well, it's if like you're allowed you know, to Sierra say. Nevada. No, I'm, I'm an I'm a open book. So uh, having I, there's a slogan on Sierra Nevada's cans that I think is very accurate to any family business, not just a family brewery. That's like family owned, operated and argued over. Um, so there is a hundred percent, all of those elements owned, operated and argued over, you know, everybody, every personality, whether it's family or not, uh, definitely wants to contribute and has their own opinion and vision on how things are. And while I might've been the guy that kind of threw all this together and threaded the needle, so to speak, at the end of the day, like I'm, I'm not just a team of one. I have investors I'm beholden to, family members that I'm accountable to on this and I want everybody to not just feel valued and important, but help mold this into what they think it needs to be. Um, a lot of the times, um, you know, I, I have a pretty good gut and can kind of figure things out, but there's been a ton of things in our history in the first four years or five, four and a half that we've been open that you just have to learn as you go. So I'm not, uh, I'm not saying I had all the answers out of the gate and I still don't. So there's, there's definitely, I think times of, you know, stress obviously that are ongoing and, and making sure things are running smoothly to become like the best version of ourselves. And, I think we were getting to that point pretty closely before the pandemic hit and then the pandemic kind of reset everything. Um, and that's been its own microcosm of a situation. But, you know, now that I, I hope that we're kind of heading towards maybe it winding down, seeing if we can get back to normal or whatever the, the new normal is to borrow an overused term the last two years, um, we'll just have to find out and kind of adapt as we go, which is all we've done basically all along. <laughs> Well, and then, you know, you also have a, a food component there there as well. And um, to me, I, I feel like a, a food component always plays well for, for breweries. And you guys seem to do do very well with uh, Mayan Street Food. How did that that kind of come about and that partnership happen? Because I, I know uh, the, the one time I was there recently, it was wonderful food and wonderful beer. And that's a, a great combination, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you know, there's a lot of breweries that are traditional restaurant brew pub kind of things, which I think is a concept that was really popular in the 90s and i think since the kind of resurgence of craft beer over the last five to seven years there's been a ton of breweries open just as tap rooms and and breweries with no food and i just didn't think that was a option for us like in order for people to drink more beer and stay longer they want to have food to eat obviously as well so for us it was you know i wanted to focus on the music and the marketing and the, and the environment of the place and you know the brewers wanted to focus on the beer those are things that we do really well and are both full-time jobs. Like, can we find a food partner that can come in and be in this with us, but also kind of be their own ancillary business to kind of capitalize off of hopefully the crowds that we could generate and also be an asset and something delicious for customers to have. So I kind of sought out uh, Bruce and Ann, the owners of Mind Cafe that's been here for 20 years. Uh, Bruce is an incredible chef and Ann is an amazing owner with operational expertise that far surpasses mine, especially in the food industry. Uh, and, you know, I, I borrowed, you know, food trucks aren't obviously a new thing, but like I, there's, there is this kind of concept that I borrowed visiting Austin one time when they have uh, Eastside Kings uh, kind of 
they were started as food trucks, but they were anchored in like these dive bars. So like they had these giant patios outside of like, I think the Grackle had one on the east side of Austin. And it was amazing, like Asian inspired street food, but it was in its own cart. So the Grackle would make all their money selling, you know, just cheap beers and whatever else they would push. And then they would have this amazing food component that will help bring in crowds and get them to stay, but they didn't really do it. Right. It wasn't mm-hmm. something they staffed or made the menu for. And I thought that was borderline genius because it was kind of the best of both worlds where Eastside Kings get to establish themselves off of a, a really solidified bar that's been around for a while and also provide delicious, sustainable food that's like way beyond just cheap bar food. Um, and I know Bruce's pedigree and what they've done at the cafe. So, you know, it being a finer dining establishment, the kind of pitch to them was do you want to come to a more casual, quick environment of a brewery and provide? some of the same fare, but, you know, toned down or reformatted for a bar and brewery scene. And fortunately, you know, we all hit it off from a chemistry perspective and just like a respect situation. And I think all the math made sense and all the investment and kind of how we structured everything made a lot of sense. And and they've been here since we opened and they're exclusive to us. And I mean, their food is phenomenal. I mean, clearly I spend a lot of time here <laughs> and uh, I've not gotten sick of eating it. Uh, I can tell you that much. And they've done a really good job at, you know, creating their own niche with Mayan street food, but also changing up the menu frequently enough and kind of adapting to what is quite frankly, like a different audience than what they might have at Mayan Cafe, um, which I think is just a benefit for them because they can kind of, you know, promote both sides and grow their own brand and, and, and restaurant. But do it in a way that's separate than what they've already done. Well, and it kind of work, works perfectly with, with what you've always gone for there. Craft beer has always got a few staples, but it's kind of always best when it's got some new things on the menu. Craft music always staples are great, but it's always nice to hear new things. And with food, I feel like it's the same way. You always want something kind of familiar, but it's always nice to see a, a, a beer and tacos. Uh, the only thing equal to it and, and maybe better depending on your mood of that day would be beer and pizza. So I don't know what <laughs> the two, <laughs> the two staples that go hand in hand. Uh, absolutely. And I feel like the, the best way to, to finish this up is just to go, what's next for you guys in, in 2022? Obviously you're hopeful to get kind of things back to the, the normal ish new normal and have a few more things going on inside the brewery, but what, what are you hoping for and, and what can folks expect for from you this, this year? Oh man. Uh, there were so many things I could answer that question with two years ago. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not going to lie. The pandemic has been brutal for people in our industry. Um, I don't think there's anybody in food and beverage that would say otherwise. Uh, it's just been different. And, you know, for a brewery specifically or, or people that are more focused on the bar side and not so much, you know, being a sit down restaurant or to go restaurant, it's just, it's ravaged us in a lot of ways that I think we were unexpected to see in, in some sense of the fashion. I think at the beginning of this, when everything was all new and unknown and very scary and there was no vaccines, like it was kind of to be expected that things were going to be super weird for a while. And then it's just been this kind of start, stop, kind of choke the engine situation uh, in terms of, oh, we're back. No, no, we're not. We're back. No, we're not. It's like variant this, variant that. So it's like stuff that everybody's heard and used to this, at this point. But from a business side, it's just been, it's hard to, to kind of create any sort of sustainability or be able to grow the business in any responsible manner when you're constantly up and down. And that's from a revenue perspective or a staffing perspective. It's, it's really challenging. So I would like to get back to some of the things that we talked about doing prior to this, which was focus on, uh, you know, dedicated private event space for us. Like we do a lot of private events, but the way we're currently physically set up isn't exactly ideal for them. Um, so I think there's an easy expansion opportunity for us to kind of do that uh, pretty quickly. And then, you know, a secondary location was in the works um, before all this. You know, there's a couple parts of, of town, like we're, we're a Louisville-based brewery. We're going to focus on Louisville. I don't think we have any desire to expand to other states or do some crazy growth pattern like that. We just kind of want to double down on where we are uh, and become like the de facto place. When you talk about a Louisville brewery, you think of Gravely. Um, I think we've done a really good job of building that brand out of the gate, but I think there's other parts of it that we need to do in order to kind of maintain and get to that level. And then the, the, the market side is a huge, huge area of growth for us. We started canning literally right before the pandemic broke. Um, so we had cans thankfully on shelves that year, but how we rolled into the market with cans was completely different than what any of us ever anticipated because we couldn't do any of the event stuff. We couldn't have the marketing behind it or, you know, kind of engage with sponsors or get into the soccer stadium or whatever it was going to be in terms of making that launch a bigger splash. Um, thankful to have them, but it was kind of a, 
another, another false start thanks to the pandemic. Um, the cans have been super successful, but I do think there's a huge like tip of the iceberg situation for us on the can side that I'm anxious to chase down uh, this year. So I just need, I think, everything to kind of not go back to normal, but just sort of take that hockey stick trajectory a little more and not so much the <laughs> up, down, backwards situation. And, you know, spring is close here in Louisville. Um, and I don't want to call it a fair weather town, but like people love being outside, especially when there's a pandemic going on. Uh, we have a great outdoor space. So I think with warmer weather and just like, hopefully some of this like pandemic angst that everybody wants to get over, uh, we can kind of get to the other side of this, but I've seen enough in the past past two years to not even bank or plan for that yet so we're just gonna <laughs> exist as we are for the time being and hopefully grow and pivot after the fact as opposed to what I did the last year was kind of keep us intact from 2020 in order for us to like regain what we were and then it just kind of became evident that wasn't going to be anytime soon so we had to kind of trim down and adjust and it was unfortunate that we had to do that but you know what are you going to do <laughs> I was going to say the, the the marketing plans or just any business plans these days, you just, you almost never know what's going to happen, whether that's supply chain issues, workforce issues, other issues and so forth, which makes a planning, which is a big part of a business, uh, very, very difficult. But like I said, you guys are doing yeah. a lot of good, good things over there. So <laughs> I, 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 I think you, you've got a good recipe and hopefully uh, life allows it to, to shine like it's supposed to. I hope so. I mean, you never, the pandemic side of this is one thing, the psychological rebound, I think for the population after this is another. So hopefully uh, people are itching to get out and to try to get back to some sense of the normal routine. But I think it's been a long two years for everybody, business owner or not. And we're just going to have to kind of wait and see how long that road to recovery or normalcy is. Well, well, Nathaniel, I appreciate you talking about about uh, your journey into beer and music and uh, how, how fun that has been to tie it in with Gravelly Brewing. And uh, I, I appreciate the time. And I, like I said, I appreciate the good beer too. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me on. It was a, it was a pleasure.